Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. An original adaptation written and read for you by John Buckeridge. Part 17. The Price of Power. The next morning Gawain slept in again. The remnants of his injuries combined with the drink of the night before gave him more than enough reason to remain in the warmth of his bed and the comfort of the covers encompassed him. He was in that delicious dozing state of early morning where you're not quite asleep but you're not quite awake and you know that either option is available to you at your leisure. This was a gift for Gawain. At home in Camelot or out in service of errantry he would be up with the sun and underway in his tasks and duties so to be given the chance to luxuriate like this was warmly welcomed. A gentle tap-tap-tapping disturbed his peaceful indulgence, and his eyes flew open. With mounting dread, the tap-tap-tapping came again, and Gawain's eyes swiveled towards the door. As it had the day before, it began to open, and there stood Lady Bertilag. Once again she was in her simple fur-lined robe, cinched shut with the green sash, Once again her hair hung down across her shoulders. Once again she looked perfect. Gawain felt the horror building in his heart and head. Oh dear, said the inner voice. It's time to dance this dance again, is it? My, my lady, he stammered. How may I serve you this morning? Is your husband once more at the hunt? As before he slipped into the more formal language of the court to try and discourage her from thinking he was anything approaching casual about this intrusion. He emphasised her husband, too, in an effort to bring her to her senses as to the danger she put them both in. As before, she did not seem to care a jot, and immediately removed the outer robe to reveal that same sheer shift she had worn on her previous visit. The sun was not so obliging in providing a helpful beam of light to highlight the features beneath, but all the same Gawain was left with no need for imagination, and was fully conscious of everything on offer in that moment. But at what cost? asked the voice in his head. What outcome would result if you choose this path? Gawain knew, as he had before, that the only outcome would be pain for all parties. He thought of the lesson Bishop Badwin had told him about Mary and Joseph and the small choices made by good people that could breed good results. He hoped that was true for him here. Come now, Lady Bertilac replied. I think we both know why I am here. My husband is away, the castle sleeps. We are quite alone. Indeed we are, lady, said Gawain. He had never come across an approach so forward before, and he found he rather liked it. His mouth went dry and he realised it was hanging wide open. He shut it firmly. Get a hold of yourself, said the voice in his mind. Now is not the time to lose control. He opened his mouth and tried again, still wrapping himself in the formal cloak he hoped would keep him safe. And what would you like to speak of today, my lady? I believe yesterday we spoke on love, did we not? We did, she replied. But have you forgotten what else we spoke on yesterday? Gawain racked his brain to remember. And what was that, lady? Of the proper greeting and departure for a lady, of course, she replied. A true knight would offer a kiss. Gawain tried to think of a courtly way to refuse. Polite or not, this seemed dangerous to him, but before he could, Lady Bertilac swept down upon him as he lay in his bed and kissed him, chastely but firmly, on the lips. Those lips again. As she drew away, Gawain had to use all his restraint not to pull her back for more. Of course, my lady. Excruciatingly, it came out with a bit of a squeak as his voice broke, and Gawain saw her mouth twitch in a small smile of satisfaction. Smooth, said his inner voice, chastising him. Really smooth. Pressing on, he cleared his throat. throat) And what would you like to speak of today? He asked again, pleased his voice stayed steady this time. I would speak more on love, replied Lady Bertilac. I have thought on your tale yesterday, and I say it is not about love at all. Is it not, lady? He asked. It seemed to have all the elements of love to me. And I can attest that Sir Owain and the Lady Laudine live luxuriously loving lives in their enchanted forest of Bresilienne. Oh, I don't doubt that there was love between them, she replied. But to me, the story is about power. Power, my lady, asked Owain. Power, she confirmed. At first, Owain uses his to slay Laudine's husband. Then he exerts his to woo her to him. 
Once they are bonded, she uses her power over him to control him, even driving him mad until he returns to her. Power, do you see? Gawain paused, thinking on what she had said. I suppose, he began tentatively, I suppose true love comes when power is shared. As I say, they live in happiness now, and perhaps that happiness is based on their equilibrium. Perhaps, Lady Bertillac replied without much commitment, but I've never seen a love that moves that way. Always in a union, one is exerting power over the other, often man over woman. Something changed in her demeanour, and her voice dropped to a low, sultry tone. Let us take this moment here, Sir Knight. Am I not within your power? You could easily take me if you willed it, and I would have no power to resist. There was that predatory flash to her eyes that he had seen the day before, and Gawain was not so certain it was not him who was within her power. Where I come from, he said, adding a touch of steel to his tone, such things are considered the foulest act a man can partake in. I would not hold you or any woman under my power in such a way. Her eyes softened, and he changed tack, allowing the steel in his voice to melt away. But you have said yourself that your husband is not a cruel man, and he does not strike me as one to lord his power over you. And yet I am still within it, she replied. But what do you know of power being held over another person? You are a man, you are a knight, and you have no concept of what it is to have power taken from you. Unbidden, Gawain's mind flashed back to one of the most upsetting memories in his life, one he had tried hard not to think on for some time. Without thinking, he said, I knew a little of that, my lady. He hadn't intended to speak, but it was out there now, so he continued, I know a little of what happens when the power of one is lorded over another. I doubt that very much, O great and mighty knight, replied Lady Bertillac, her voice dripping with scorn. But if you would like to try to entertain me with a story, then I shall not take it amiss. Unless you can think of some other activity for the two of us. She stretched luxuriously like a cat in a sunbeam, and Gawain saw every curve of her in a way he found extremely appealing. Steady, said the voice in his head, you have come too far to lose yourself now. Taking a breath, he began his tale. This is the story of a great friend of mine, Peridor. Peridor is the son of a warrior slain in battle. After the death of her husband, Peridor's mother, a wise and noble woman, took him deep into a forest and raised him with no knowledge of war or combat. And so they lived in blissful joy for many years. However, war found their way to them, as war often will, and one day Peridor, still a child but on the cusp of manhood, met two of the knights of Arthur's table and became enamoured of them. Seeing these two great striding fellows, he decided this was what he wanted to be, and though his mother was heartbroken to hear it, she knew she could do little to stop him. Years passed, and it came time for Peridor to leave his mother. She did her best to equip him as a warrior, but as she had raised him without any knowledge of war, there was little by way of arms or armour in their home. Still, she sent him off with what she could and their piebald shaggy horse, and so it was that Peridor arrived in the court of Camelot. I'll bet he made a fine sight there among you great and noble knights, eh? asked Lady Bertillac. Indeed, Lady, Gawain agreed, he was a figure of some scorn in his dishevelled appearance. Many laughs were levelled at him, and I must confess I laughed along with them. But foremost among these were Sir Kay, Arthur's oldest friend. He has always had a quick tongue, and though he has a good heart, that tongue has several sharp edges. Many of these struck Peridor grievously. Eventually, he rode away from the court, determined to prove himself worthy of a seat at the table, and over the next few years he worked tirelessly. He bested warriors and beasts and knights with great skill, and always he would let them yield and leave in peace, showing the knightly virtue of mercy, and knowing that the victory was in a battle well fought, not the needless death of another. I came to know him well in this time, and the two of us became close. This is all very well, interrupted Lady Bertillac, but I see no mention of power here. I am coming to that lady, I swear, said Gawain. So one day, Peridor arrived at a sad fortress fallen on hard times. The countess there told him that the whole realm had been overrun by a coven of nine witches under the command of the most powerful sorceress of all, Morgan Le Fay. Morgan Le Fay? asked Lady Bertillac. 
and there was a look in her eye that Gawain could not recognize. You have heard of her? he asked. I have, replied the lady in a guarded voice, somewhat. She's the king's sister, isn't she? She is, lady. As it happens, she is also my aunt, although I cannot claim any close connection to her. Above this, though, she is a powerful and terrifying enchantress, Gawain continued. Her brood had taken over the realm and were ruling it like tyrants. The countess who told this to Peridor told him that her own house was the sole one standing, and even now one of the nine was on her way there. Peridor vowed to defend the place, and when the hag arrived, he fought her with all his might. Eventually, he defeated the witch and she begged for mercy. As was Peridor's custom, he granted it, and this was his first great mistake. The witch tempted him, telling him of all the great powers that lay in the castle of the Nine, and all the great things they could teach him. Thinking that knighthood now lay in his grasp, my friend agreed. This was his second great mistake. He rode with the witch to the castle of the Nine and stayed there for many weeks. I don't know what was taught him there, or what lessons he learned, but when he emerged, it was with new arms and armour, and a new anger in his heart. Somehow the power of Morgan le Fay and her coven had worked their way into my friend, because over the next years he continued to ride in errantry, but there was no mercy in him any more. Where he faced men or beasts in battle, he left only death and destruction. And you assume it's only due to the power of the Nine, interrupted Lady Bertilac. Could it not just be that he changed his outlook on his own? Lady, I swear to you, I knew this man, Gawain replied. He was my great friend. But when he came out of that castle, he was... changed. We saw it most clearly when he next encountered Sir Kay, who had been so mocking to him when he first came to court. Peridor challenged him in combat and bested him with ease, hooking him beautifully under the chin with his spear and throwing him from his horse. We all thought this was a lesson well taught by Peridor, and that Kay would show him the respect he deserved now. But Peridor was not done. He kicked his horse into a trot and rode over the body of Kay a full twenty-one times before we could haul him away. Kay's armour saved his life, but only barely. His body was broken, and even years on he does not move so well as he should. For his part, Peridor showed no remorse. He just spat and rode away. Lady Bertilac was quiet now as the truth of the matter sank in. Eventually, Arthur decreed that the rule of the Nine must be broken, and a warband was formed to destroy them. Peridor rode with us, but I could see he was conflicted in his heart. As the battle commenced, we knights were able to handle most of the sorceresses, but their leader, Morgan le Fay, was too much for us. One by one she defeated men, weaving mighty magic all around her, and all the while Peridor stood by her side and did nothing. So deep was he within her power. Eventually she slew three knights and turned her anger upon me. Here Gawain paused, pushing down the horrific memories he had tried hard to deny. Finally, Peridor could stand no more. He thrust forth with the spear Morgan herself had given to him and brought her down. Shedding the armour she had gifted to him, he stood over her and she begged for mercy. Returning to his old self, Peridor granted it. This was his third great mistake. But you said mercy was the virtue of a knight, Lady Bertilac interjected. You cannot say he has done wrong when he offers it now. Mercy to some, yes, replied Gawain. In fact, mercy to most. But mercy to Morgan le Fay, no. She has wrought more pain and horror on this land than any other force, and the world would be better without her. He paused a moment, the memory of all he'd seen suddenly heavy upon him. Still, he went on, Peridor was back as he always should have been, and without her power over him he once more became a force for good in the world. He has taken solemn vows to atone for the evil he did during his time under Morgan's power, and I have even heard him say that he will seek out the Holy Grail itself, though I do not know if that is serious or bluster. So, you see, my lady, I know a little of what damage power wielded over another can do. I would not see it done again, not if I could help it.
There was another silence, and as with the previous day, Gawain heard the sounds of the castle beginning to wake. Lady Bertilak stood before him, a look of discomfort and distress on her face, and Gawain was just about to apologise for the upset he caused her when she spoke. Thank you, Sir Knight. You've given me much to think on. Her head hung for a moment, and Gawain started forward, though he wasn't sure what he intended to do when he got there. Before he took a step, though, she looked up, and that playful smile was once again on her lips. I must go, but I shall not do so without the proper departure. Those deep blue eyes sparkled, and Gawain knew full well what she meant. Stepping forward, he kissed her softly on the mouth. As he did so, she let go a soft, moaning sigh that sent ripples of excitement through Gawain, and every instinct in him wanted to throw consequence to the wind, wrap his arms around her, and get lost in the scent and thrill of her. Children, think only of pleasure, said the voice within him. Grown adults must think of more. However much he wanted to deny it, he knew the voice was right. He pulled away and bent to pick up her discarded robe, holding it out to her. As he did, he saw a look of shock on Lady Bertilak's face, peppered with small shards of anger and embarrassment. She took the gown without a word and left the room. Gawain stared at the closed door, his mind reeling, and the small voice in his head piped up, saying, Well, that went well. Gawain was not so sure that it had. Thank you for listening. Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is a Settle Stories Commission. Written and read for you by John Buckeridge. Story consultant was Miriam Sarin. Music was Tectonic by Syedra, downloaded via Upbeat. It was a Parable Arts production. <laughs>